this lesson will be just focusing on 1a and 1b. Work out 2 1 7 plus 1 1 quarter. So the first thing I like to do when I encounter a question like this is to convert the mixed numbers into an improper fraction. And the way we can do that is by multiplying the denominator, for example 7, by 2 and then adding the numerator. So 7 times 2 is 14 plus the 1 is 15. So we should have 15 as the numerator and 7 as the denominator. Plus, we're going to follow the same procedures again. 4 times 1, which is 4, plus the 1 is 5. So 5 over 4. When we add fractions, we need to find the common denominator. And the way we can find the common denominator is by multiplying the left fraction, numerator and the denominator by 4. So 15 times 4 and 7 times 4. I'm going to multiply 7 with the right hand numerator and the denominator by 7. So 5 times 7 and 4 times 7. Now I'm just going to simplify it further. So 4 times 15 is 60. 4 times 7, 28. 5 times 7, 35. Four times seven, twenty-eight. Now I can add the fractions together, so I can add the numerators together. So sixty plus thirty-five is ninety-five. The denominators remain the same, so it's gonna be twenty-eight. So our final answer is ninety-five. over 28. Now when we encounter questions that involve div dividing two fractions, the first thing I like to do is change the division sign in the middle. And the way we can do that is by taking the reciprocal of the right hand side fraction. Once we've taken the reciprocal of the right hand side fraction, then we can multiply the two fractions together. So the reciprocal of the right hand side fraction is 4 over 3. Now I'm just going to convert this mixed number into improper fraction. So 5 times 1, which is 5, plus the 1, 6. So it's 6 over 5. Now I'm going to multiply across. So 6 times 4 is 24. 5 times 3 is 15. I'm going to simplify this further by dividing the numerator and the denominator by 3. So therefore we should have 8 over 5. Now I need to convert this into a mix mixed number. So how many times 5 going to 8? 1. So it'll be 1. Remainder is 3, so that goes in the numerator over 5. So that's our final answer. Question 2. In a village, the number of houses and the number of flats are in the ratio 7 to 4. The number of flats and the number of bungalows are in the ratio 8 to 5. There are 50 bungalows in the village. How many houses are there in the village? So what we have so far is houses we have flats and we have bungalows.
the ratio of houses to flat is 7 to 4. The ratio of flats to bungalows is 8 to 5. So what we need to do next is to make the flat part in the ratio the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the top ratio by 2. So we should have 14, 8, and 5. So I know 5 parts is equal to 50 bungalows. How much is 1 part? And the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to divide 50 by 5. Okay, so 50 bungalows divided by 5 parts equals 10. Okay, one part is worth 10. So if one part is equal to 10, I need 14 parts. Therefore, I'm going to multiply 10 times 14 parts. This will give us the number of houses. So 10 times 14 equals 140 houses. So that's our final answer. Question three. Renee buys five kilograms of sweets to sell. She pays 10 pounds for the sweets. Renee puts all the sweets into bags. She puts 250 grams of sweets into each bag. She sells each bag of sweets for 65p. Renee sells all the bags of sweets. Work out her percentage profit. So the first thing I'm gonna do is to convert 250 grams into kilograms. So, 250 grams, convert that into kilograms. So I'm going to divide it by 1,000. So therefore, it's going to be 0 0.25 kilograms. Therefore, one bag weighs 0 0.25 kilograms. So how many bags would Renee need? To find that, we need to find how many times 0 0.25 kilograms goes into 5 kilograms. Well, the answer is 20. So, Renee has 20 bags. Renee sells each bag for 65p. So, we're going to multiply 20 by 65p. I'll put the decimal place at the end. So, I'm just going to multiply that out. 5 times 0, 0. 5 times 10, sorry, 5 times 2, 10. Put the place, hold it here. 6 times 0, 0. 6 times 2 is 12. Now I'm just going to add them up together. And then I'm going to put the decimals in. So Renee makes 13 pounds by selling 20 bags at 65p. To find the percentage profit, we're going to be using this general equation. Okay, so new minus the old divided by old and then we're going to multiply it by a hundred okay so the new price is 13 pound the old is how much you paid for it which is 10 
and we're going to divide it by 10 and then we're going to multiply it by 100 to find the percentage profit. So 13 minus the 10 divided by 10 and then we're going to multiply that by 100 which will give us the percentage profit. So the percentage profit is 30%. So that's how much profit Rene will make. Question four. A cycle race across America is 3,069.25 miles in length. Juan knows his average speed for his previous races is 15.12 miles per hour. For the next race across America, he will cycle for eight hours per day. Estimate how many days Juan will take to complete the race. So the first thing I need to do is to calculate the number of miles Juan covers in one day. So I'm going to round 15.12 miles per hour to 15 miles per hour and then multiply it by 8. So 15 times 8 40 So Juan covers 120 miles in one day. I'm then going to round 3,026.25 miles to 3,000 miles. This enables me to divide 3,000 miles by 120. So 120, 3,000, zero, zero, 30. So how many times does 120 go into 300? Twice. The remainder is 60. How many times is 120 going to 600? 5. So it will take Juan 25 days to complete the race. So the answer is 25 days to complete the race. Complete. rates. So that's our answer. Juan trains for the race. The average speed he can cycle at increases. It is now 16.27 miles per hour. How does this affect your answer to part A? Well it will decrease the number of days. So he will complete it a lot faster. So decrease the number of days to complete the race to complete the race. So that's our final answer. Question 5. Here is a solid square base pyramid V A B C D. The base of the pyramid is a square of sides 6 cm. The height of the pyramid is 4 cm. M is the midpoint of B C and V M equals 5 cm. Draw an accurate front elevation of the pyramid from the direction of the arrow. So the first thing we notice about this pyramid is that the base length is 6 centimeters. So therefore, I'm going to draw 6 centimeters as my base. So each of these squares is 1 centimeters. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Right. The height is 4 centimeters. So midpoint here, 
one, two, three, four. I'm just going to connect them together. And I'm just going to remove that line. So that is the front elevation of the pyramid. Question 5b. Work out the total surface area of the pyramid. So the first thing that we need to do is to work out the surface area of one triangle. So this is the first triangle that we need to work out. The base of this triangle is six centimeters according to the measurements given to us in the question. And the height is five centimeters. So this is five centimeters. Now to work out the area of a triangle, we need to use this general equation. So area of triangle, oops, is height times base divided by two. Now the height of this triangle is five centimeters. The base of this triangle is six centimeters. Then divide it by two. So five centimeters times six centimeters is 30 centimeters squared. I'm gonna divide that by two, which is 15 centimeters squared. Now, if you look carefully at the diagram, we have four triangles. So therefore, I'm going to multiply the surface area, which is 15 centimeters squared, by four, which will give us the total surface area, area of the four triangles. So 15 centimeters squared times it by four, equals 60 centimeters squared. Now we need to find the area of the square which represents the base of the pyramid. So to find out the area of the square we're going to do height times base. equals height times base so a rough sketch so the height is six centimeters base is six centimeters so to find out the area we're going to do six times six six centimeters times six centimeters equals 36 centimeters squared I'm now going to add the total surface areas together so it is 60 centimeters squared plus 36 centimeters squared equals 96 centimeters squared. Therefore, the total surface area of the pyramid is 96 centimeters squared. So that's our final answer. Question six, a pattern is made from four identical squares. The sides of the squares are parallel to the axes. Point A has coordinates six, seven. 
Point B has coordinates 38 and 36. Point C is marked on the diagram. Work out the coordinates of C. So the first thing I'm going to do is to find the difference in the x-axis between point A and point B. So it's 38 minus 6, which is 32. So 38 minus 6 equals 32. So the difference between the two x points is 32. Let me squeeze that in here. 32. I'm then going to divide 32 by 4 as there's four identical squares between point A and point B. So let me just quickly illustrate this for you. So we have this goes over here, this goes over here, this goes over here, this goes over here, draw a line across, this goes over here, this goes over here, this goes over here, and this goes over here. So 32 divided by 4 which gives us 8. Therefore, the length of all the sides of the square is 8. So this is 8, 8, 8, 8. We have 8 over here, 8 over here, and 8 over here. From point A, it will take us two sides of squares to reach point C on the x-axis. So we have one side here and one side here. That is a total of 16 units on the x-axis. So therefore, I'm going to add 6 plus 16, which is 22. The x-coordinate for point C is 22. So it's 6 plus 16 equals 22. Point C X coordinate equals 22. Bearing in mind the length of each side of the square is 8. From point B, the y-axis, we would therefore need to subtract two sides of the length 8. Therefore, the y-coordinate of point C is 20. So, 36, subtract that from 8. And then I'm going to subtract it again, which gives us 20. So therefore, point C on the y coordinate, point C, y coordinate, equals 20. So overall, point C's coordinates are 22 and 20. So that's our final answer. Question 7. Shape T is reflected in the line x equals negative 1 to give shape R. Shape R is reflected in the line y equals negative 2 to give shape S. Describe the single transformation that will map shape T to shape S. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the line x equals negative 1 into the graph. So x equals to negative 1 is here. Now I'm just going to reflect shape T. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to select the corner, so I'm going to select this corner and ask myself how far is this corner away from x equal to minus 1. 
So that's one, two. So I'm going to count two again to the left hand side. One, two. So this point now is over here. Now I'm going to follow the same procedures again. So this is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Again, repeat the procedure at this point over here. One, two, three. One, two, three. Now I'm going to join the points together. So this is shape R. Now it says shape R is reflected in the line Y equals negative 2 to give shape S. So again, I'm going to put the line y equals negative 2 into the graph. So y equals to negative 2 is over here. And now I'm going to reflect it. So again, how far is this point away from the line y equals to negative 2? So we have 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. How far away this point is? 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. How far away is this point? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. I'm just gonna add the points together. Sorry, join the points together. And that is shape S. It says describe the single transformation that will map shape T to shape S. Well, it's rotation anti clockwise hundred and eighty degrees from the point minus one and minus two. So that's our answer. Question 8. The perimeter of a right angled triangle is 72 centimeters. The length of its sides are in the ratio 3 to 4 to 5. Work out the area of the triangle. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add up the parts. So we have 3 plus 4 plus 5. So we have 3 plus 4 plus 5, which equals 12. Now our next step is to find how many times 12 goes into 72. Well, so we're going to do 72 divided by 12, which is 6. So each part is worth 6. So therefore, I'm going to multiply 6 times 3, which is 18. Four times 6, which is 24. and 6 times 5 which is 30 and bearing in mind that this is a right angled triangle therefore the hypotenuse must be the longest length so if I was to construct a right angled triangle right now so let's quickly do a rough sketch The hypotenuse length can be identified as it's always opposite the right angle. So this is the hypotenuse. And the hypotenuse is, the, is always the longest length. Therefore, 30 is the hypotenuse. This side is 18. And this side is 24. Now, how do we find the area of a triangle? We're going to do height times base divided by 2. So the height is 18, the base is 24, so 18 times 24 divided by 2, 
which equals to 216 centimeters squared. Okay, so that's our final answer for 8. 9a, write down the value of 36 raised to the power of a half. So what we need to do to answer this question is to square root 36. Square root 36 is 6. Therefore our answer is 6. 9b, write down the value of 23 raised to the power of 0. Anything raised to the power of 0 is automatically 1. 9c, work out the value of 27 raised to the power of negative 2 thirds. So the first thing you need to do whenever there is a number that is raised to the power of negative is to write 1 as the numerator. So we have 1 as the numerator. Now I'm going to include 27 raised to the power of 2 thirds. If you notice, 3 is on the denominator, so therefore I'm going to take the third root of 27 and then, and then I'm going to raise it to the power of 2. So the third root of 27 is 3 and I'm going to raise it to the power of 2. So therefore our answer should be 1 over 9. That is the final answer, 1 over 9. Question 10. The table gives some information about the height of 80 girls. Least height 133 centimeters, greatest height 170 centimeters, lower quartile 145 centimeters, upper quartile 157 centimeters, median 151 centimeters. Draw a box plot to represent this information. So the least height is 133 centimeters, so I need to draw a line to represent 133. So this is 131, 132, and this is 133, so we're going to go up. The next one is the greatest height, which is 170 centimeters, 170 centimeters here. The lower quartile is 145 centimeters, 145 is right here. The upper quartile is 157 centimeters, so this is 155, 156, 157. The median is 151 centimeters, so this is 150, 151 is here. I'm just going to complete my box plot. And that's your final answer. 10b. Work out an estimate for the number of these girls with a height between 133 centimeters and 157 centimeters. Since 157 centimeters is the upper quartile, it represents 75% of the data. Therefore, we need to find 75% of the 80 girls. Hence, I'm going to multiply 80 by 0.75. So we have 80 over here, multiply by 75. What I like to do, I like to add the decimals at the end of the answer. Okay, so 5 times 0 is 0, 5 times 8 is 40. Put the placeholder here. 7 times 0 is 0, 7 times 8 is 56. Add it together, so we have 6,000, and then I'm going to put my decimal back in, so it should be 60. So 60 girls are between 133 centimeters and 157 centimeters. Question 11. A and B are points on a circle, center O. BC is a tangent to the circle. AOC is a straight line. Angle ABO equals x degrees. Find the size of angle ACB in terms of x. Give your answer in its simplest form. Give reasons for each stage of your working. According to our circle theorem, whenever a radius and a tangent join together, it forms 90 degrees. 
So the radius from O to B joins a tangent from C to B and forms 90 degrees. Therefore, angle O B C is equal to 90 degrees. We also know the angle ABO which is given as x degrees. So ABO is x degrees, so let's write that over here. Now let's look closely at this triangle ABO. It forms an isosceles triangle as they have the same radius, so this length is equal to this length. Therefore angle BAO is equal to x degrees. So what we have so far is angle A, B, O is equal to x degrees and also angle B, A, O is also equal to x degrees. Now angle ABO is 90 degrees plus the x degrees. So let's write that down. Angle ABC is equal to 90 degrees plus x degrees. We all know angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Therefore, Angle A, C, B is equal to 180 degrees minus angle A, B, C minus angle B, A, O. So 180 degrees minus angle ABC, ABC is equal to 90 degrees plus X degrees. So let's put that in brackets over here. 90 degrees plus X degrees, close brackets. Also minus x degrees. I'm going to expand the brackets. 180 degrees minus 90 degrees minus x degrees minus x degrees. Simplify it further so you have 90 degrees minus 2x. Therefore angle ACB is equal to 90 degrees minus 2x. So that's our final answer. Question 12. Prove that the square of an odd number is always one more than a multiple of four. So odd numbers can be represented as 2n plus 1. I'm now going to take the square of 2n plus 1. So 2n plus 1. Square it. So it should be 2 n plus 1, open brackets, 2 n plus 1. I'm now going to expand the brackets. So 2 n times 2 n is 4 n squared. 2 n times 1 is 2 n. 1 times 2 n, which is 2 n. 1 times 1 is 1. 
I'm then going to collect like for like terms, so 2n squared plus 4n plus 1. I'm then going to take 4 out, so 4 open brackets n squared plus n close brackets plus 1. This proves that the square of an odd number is always one more than the multiple of 4. Question 13. Square root 5, open bracket, square root 8 plus square root 18, close brackets, can be written in the form a square root 10, where a is an integer. Find the value of a. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to expand the bracket. I'm going to multiply square root 5 times square root 8. So square root 5 times square root 8 is equal to the square root of 40. My next step is to multiply the square root of 5 times the square root of 18. So the square root of 5 times the square root of 18 is equal to the square root of 90. So we have, so far, square root 40 plus the square root of 90. Now, I can simplify the square root of 40. So, square root 2 times square root of 2 times square root of 5 times square root of 2 equals square root of 40. Right? Now this can be simplified further. So square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2 times square root of 5 times square root of 10, which is square root, sorry, did I say 10? It should be square root 2 times square root 5, which is square root 10. So this is simplified further as square root 40. Now again, square root 90 can be simplified further. So square root 90 can be written as square root 3 times square root 3 times square root 5 times square root 2 which equals 3 square root 10. So effectively what we have is 3 square root 10 is equal to square root 90. So we have 3 square root 10 plus 2 square root 10 add them up together which equals 5 square root 10 therefore a is equal to 5. Question 14 y is inversely proportional to d squared. When d equals 10, y equals 4. d is directly proportional to x squared. When x equals 2, d equals 24. Find a formula for y in terms of x. Give your answer in its simplest form. So the first thing I'm going to do is to focus on the inversely proportional section. So what we need to do first is write the statement of proportionality. So y is inversely proportional to 1 over d squared. Now we need to write down the formula. So y equals k over d squared. Given we have the values of y and d, we can solve for k. So 
value of y is 4 equals k over 10 squared. 10 squared is 100. So 4 equals k over 100. To make k the subject, we need to multiply both sides by 100. So 4 times 100 is 400. Therefore, the value of k is 400. So we have y is equal to 400 over d squared. Now I'm going to focus on the directly proportional uh, section of the question. So first we need to write down the statement of proportionality. So d is equal to kx squared. Our next step is to write the formula. So d equals kx squared. Given that we have the values of x and d, we can find the value of k. So, value of d is 24 equals k. Value of x is 2, so 2 squared. 2 squared is 4, so 4k four on this side and 24 on this side. To make k the subject, I'm going to divide both sides by 4. So we have 24 divided by 4 equals 6. Therefore, 6 is equal. Therefore, 6, k is equal to 6. Therefore, k is equal to 6. So essentially, what we have is d equals 6x squared. So the two equations that we have so far, we have y equals 400 over d squared and d equals 6x squared. Now we need to make y the subject, so we're going to substitute d equals 6x squared into y equals 400 over d squared. So y equals 400 over 6x squared. Okay, and then I'm going to expand the brackets. So we have y equals 400 over 36x raised to the power of 4. I'm then going to simplify it further. So our answer should be y equals 100 over 9 x raised to the power of 4. So that's our final answer. Question 15a. Factorize a squared minus b squared. a squared minus b squared is the difference of two squares. Therefore our answer is, open brackets, a plus b, close brackets, open brackets, a minus b. 15b. Hence, or otherwise, simplify fully, open brackets, x squared plus 4, close brackets, raised to the power of 2, minus, open brackets, x squared minus 2, close brackets, raised to the power of 2. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to expand the brackets on the left-hand side. So what we have is x squared plus 4 close brackets, open bracket, x squared, plus 4, close brackets, minus, open brackets, x squared, minus 
to close bracket open bracket x squared minus 2 close bracket. I'm then going to expand the brackets on the left hand side and on the right hand side. So let's put that on there. x squared times x squared is x raised to the power of 4. x squared times 4 is 4x squared. Four times x squared is four x squared. Four times four is sixteen. Going to do the same thing over here. X squared times x squared is x raised to the power of four. X squared times negative two is negative 2x squared minus 2 times x squared is minus 2x squared minus 2 times minus 2 is positive 4 I'm then going to simplify this further so we have x raised to the power of 4 plus 8 x squared plus 16 minus x raised to the power of 4 minus 4x squared plus 4 I'm then going to multiply this side by negative 1. So we should have minus x raised to the power of 4 plus 4x squared minus 4. And on this side, x raised to the power of 4 plus 8x squared plus 16. I'm then going to simplify it further. So x raised to the power of 4 minus x raised to the power of 4 is 0. 8x squared plus 4x squared is 12 x squared 16 minus 4 is 12 so that's our final answer question 16 there are only red counters blue counters and purple counters in a bag the ratio of the number of red counters to the number of blue counters is 3 to 17 sam takes at random a counter from a bag the probability that the counter is purple is 0.2. Work out the probability that Sam takes a red counter. So the probability of a purple counter is 0.2. So to find the probability of taking a blue or red counter, we need to subtract uh, 0.2 from 1. So 1 minus 0.2 equals 0.8. So the probability of taking a red or a blue counter is 0.8. Therefore I need to split the probability which is 0.8 in a ratio 3 to 17. So we need to add all the parts together 3 plus 17 equals 20. And then I'm going to divide 0 0.8 by 20. So 0 0.8 divided by 20 equals 0 0.4. So one part is worth 0 0.4. 
we want three parts, which is equal to red, the red counter. So we're going to multiply 0 0.04 by 3. So 0 0.04 times it by 3, which equals to 0 12. So that's the probability of Sam selecting a red counter. So 0.12. Question 17. Simplify fully 3x squared minus 8x minus 3 over 2x squared minus 6x. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to factorize the numerator. When the a coefficient is greater than 1, the way I like to factorize this is by multiplying the a coefficient with the c coefficient. So 3 times negative 3 is equal to minus 9. Now, I need to find two numbers that you multiply together that gives us negative 9 but also adds up to negative 8. Well, the two numbers are minus 9 and a positive 1. My next step is to open the brackets. So we have open brackets 3x close brackets open brackets 3x close brackets. I'm going to simplify the right hand side bracket further later on. So now I'm going to include plus 1 here and minus 9. I'm going to simplify the right hand side bracket by dividing everything inside it by 3. So 3x divided by 3 is 1x and negative 9 divided by 3 is 3. So I've just factorized the numerator 3x squared minus 9 minus 8x sorry minus 3. So we should have 3x plus 1, close brackets, open brackets, x minus 3. Now I'm just going to factorize the denominator, 2x squared minus 6x. So I'm going to take the common, highest common factor, which is 2, and the common variable, x. So outside the bracket should be 2x open brackets x minus 3 close brackets what I'm going to do next is I'm going to cancel x minus 3 on the numerator and x minus 3 on the denominator by dividing each of them together so x minus 3 divided by x minus 3 equals 1 so we should have on the numerator 3 x plus 1 over 2x and that's the final answer. Question 18. Here is a graph of y equals sine theta for minus 180 degrees less than or equal to x less than or equal to 180 degrees. On the grid Sketch the graph of y equals sine theta minus 2 for minus 180 degrees less than or equal to x less than or equal to 180 degrees. So essentially what we're doing is we're moving the graph y equals sine theta down by 2. Okay, so 0, this position goes down over here. 90 which is minus 1, should go down to minus 3. 0, minus 2 over here. Here, we need to push it up by, yep, here. And this goes to minus 2. And now I'm going to connect the points together. So hopefully, it's giving me a smooth curve. And that's our final answer. Question 19. The point P has coordinates 3 and 4.
the point Q has coordinates A and B. A line perpendicular to PQ is given by the equation 3x plus 2y equals 7. Find an expression for B in terms of A. So the first thing I'm going to do is rearrange the equation of the perpendicular line to make Y the subject. So we have 3x plus 2y equals 7. I'm then going to subtract 3x from both sides. So we have 2y equals minus 3x plus 7 and then I'm going to divide 2 from both sides so we have y equals negative 3 over 2x plus 7 over 2 so the gradient of the perpendicular line is negative 3 over 2 when we encounter questions involving the perpendicular line, we need to remember the general equation. So the general equation is given as gradient one times the perpendicular line So the perpendicular gradient equals negative 1. Now to find the gradient of PQ, I'm just going to substitute in the gradient of the perpendicular line into this equation. And then we're going to make the gradient of PQ the subject. Okay, so gradient... of p q times the perpendicular gradient which is negative 3 over 2 is equal to minus 1. I'm going to make the gradient of p q the subject by dividing both sides by negative 3 over 2. So we have gradient of p q is equal to one sorry negative one divided by negative three over two can be simplified further as gradient of p q is equal to two over three. So this is the gradient of p q two over three. I'm then going to write the general equation of the gradient. So the general equation of the gradient is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 equals the gradient. So this is the general equation to find any gradient. So what we have so far is open bracket 3, 4, close brackets, open brackets, A, B, close brackets. I'm going to label these points 
x1, y1, x2, y2. I'm then going to substitute these points into this equation and then I'm going to equate it to the gradient of PQ which is two thirds. So what we should have is y2 which is b minus y1 which is 4. So we have b minus 4 over x2 which is a minus x1 which is 3. a minus 3 equals 2 thirds. Now I need to make b the subject so I'm going to multiply both sides by a minus 3. So we have b minus 4 open brackets 2 over 3 open brackets a minus 3. I'm then going to expand the brackets so b minus 4 over here so 2 thirds times it by a which is 2a over 3 2 thirds times it by negative 3 which is 2 at this stage I need to make b the subject so I'm going to add 4 to both sides so what we should have is b is equal to 2a over 3 plus 2 and that's our final answer. Question 20. n is an integer such that 3n plus 2 less than or equal to 14 and 6n over n squared plus 5 greater than 1. Find all the possible values of n. So the first thing I'm going to do is solve for n so 3n plus 2 less than or equal to 14. I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides. So we're left with 3n less than or equal to 12. I'm then going to divide 3 from both sides. So we have n less than or equal to 4. So that's the first criteria. n has to be less than or equal to 4. The next inequality we have is 6n over n squared plus 5 greater than 1. What I'm going to do first is multiply both sides by n squared plus 5. So we should have 6n greater than n squared plus 5. I'm then going to subtract n squared from both sides. So we have minus n squared plus 6n greater than 5. I'm also going to subtract minus 5 from both sides. Minus 5, minus 5. So we should have minus n squared plus 6n minus 5. 5 greater than 0. I'm now going to multiply both sides by negative 1 and once you've done that you flip the sign of the inequality so we should have n squared minus 6n plus 5 less than 0. I'm then going to factorize n squared minus 6n plus 5. So we have n, n 
minus, minus, five goes over here, one goes over here, less than zero. Therefore, n is equal to five or one. Quickly gonna draw a rough sketch. So, so this is one and five. So when n is between one and five, the value of y well, axis is less than zero. So all the values of y are less than zero when n is between one and five. So our answer should be one less than n less than five. We now need to combine the two criteria together. So in the first inequality, n must be less than or equal to four. So Therefore, I'm going to rewrite the inequality as 1 less than n less than or equal to 4. So the possible values of n equals 2, 3, and 4. So that's our final answer.